Hi, welcome to season 13. Um, I'm Mary Abazia and with me is Tom Spitali and Sean Wellam and we're all from Impact Planning Group. And uh, this season is really about what's happening around us. Um, and so we thought the inflation was interesting to delve into because it's affecting strategies and company performance. So this is about strategies to prosper in inflationary times. And um, Sean, I think you, uh, you're the next up. Uh, what? How do you want to take this path? I almost feel like the first thing we should do is is introduce inflation to a lot of people that haven't experienced it in their adult lives, <laughs> because, you know, we grew up in a time where inflation was uh, was high, sometimes out of control, and and really dictated the economic landscape to a large extent, and and policies over the the 80s and the 90s were all aimed at one thing, which was to rein in inflation. It was deemed as the, the single biggest economic risk to our prosperity was, was, uh, was runaway inflation. And as a consequence, we've enjoyed 20 years of relatively low inflation. And in many cases, uh, you know, prices have dropped in real terms for certain products, and, and many have stayed the same. So the first thing is to say we're now in this really strong inflationary cycle which means prices are going up and they're going up for lots of different reasons for, for there's labor shortages there's an excess of demand over supply which is the classic cause of inflation and we're, we're starting to see employment very strong that drives wage inflation wage inflation adds to costs costs put up the cost of living for us and we need more wages to buy the same stuff we had before it's a vicious circle which is why it was so so much a focus in the uh, the 80s and 90s to rein it in to bring it under control so that's a brief economic history lesson for those that that cared or wanted it or needed it but the reality is we're now in an inflationary cycle we're coming out of a pandemic we're seeing increase in demand we're seeing tightening of labor markets we're seeing shortages in key skills and we're seeing shortages in key materials and all these things are feeding into the increased prices. Um, some forecasts, Tesla forecasts that their cost of raw materials for their car, they, they originally thought they might double through this inflationary cycle. Now they're saying they might go up threefold. It's a huge pressure onto the bottom line, but as every external environmental issue, you need to adapt your marketing within those bounds of reality. And that's what we really wanted to talk about is how does this, this relatively unknown concept of inflation drive marketing behaviors? And, and what does it mean for the, the people in charge of driving products? With that, what do you guys think? Where, where's, the, uh, where's the impact of this? Well, I think it depends on the type of, uh, and the resources in your company. And, you know, if they're, are different functions outside of marketing who are predicting um, inflation and, and how it's going to play out over the mid and long term. Because it seems really important to have at least some kind of scenario planning done, you know, kind of a, an idea of, okay, what are the chances that inflation just just stays at its current level for an extended period of time? Or what are the chances that we go and level out? What are the chances that we come all the way back to uh, historical, you know, recent history and, and, and relatively low levels of inflation, Sean, that you, you talked about in the history lesson? Because all of that is going to impact um, strategies, supply strategies, pricing strategies, how aggressive you know you should be, how um, short or long term your 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 plans are in terms of managing supply and managing price. You know, just having those different scenario plans. And if if you're in an organization where maybe that isn't happening, maybe it's an opportunity for marketing to take some leadership, or or at least some partnership with. You know, the, whoever is managing finance in your firm, you know, depending on what size of firm you are in some medium sized firms, maybe marketing this is an opportunity for marketing to take some leadership on this to create 
and develop some of these scenarios um, so that the entire organization can begin to plan around the likelihood of these different inflationary scenarios and make strategy from that context. What do you think, Mary? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because um, we've been talking with a lot of companies from different industries and it's a theme that we're hearing that senior management is saying, I need my marketers to be more financially savvy. They need to know how to work, you know, the basics of finance, especially when, you know, if they're, if, if they really are doing their job, they're looking at the whole picture of a product or a portfolio, including as Sean, like you said, if the costs are going up or tell me you were talking about supplies, you kind of, their job is to orchestrate all of that and it lands on a PL. So being able to, to work that. And if they don't either find a finance as a friend to make sure that, you know, together you're working on it, like you're saying, Tom, and, and, um, asking finance to give you some lessons in how to do better financial planning for your, your products, because those, there's a lot of moving levers, as Sean has said, you know, when you're looking at the performance of your product, it's not just, can I raise price? It, it, it's not static. It's more dynamic than ever. So having several, you know, considerations for your pricing strategy has to be part of your daily job now. And another part of this situation is it's it's very contextual. It depends very much on your product in lots of different ways. If you have a, a product that's more of a necessity, if you're selling uh, pet food, is an example, um, infant formula, there's certain products that that and, and other staples, certain products that are, are somewhat immune to the the demand will will stay constant, and you may have competition, but is your product one that will with, will suffer from a demand reduction? Is it is it one of the areas where people rein back their spending? So some discretionary spending, um, it will force people maybe to look at alternatives. So you need to understand where your product sits in terms of premium versus mid market versus budget. You know, are people going to be more budget conscious? What are the alternatives? One of the funny things when you look at your very specific environment is a lot of the tools that came out in the 80s, like Porter's Five Forces, are really <laughs> apt in moments like this. You really have to relook and think, where's the pressure coming from? Where's the power? Is it with the buyers, the suppliers? What's the threat of new entrants or substitutes? You have to have a really strong look at your products and understand how inflation will impact you. It's also an opportunity, obviously, to increase prices. We've often said the hardest thing you do in business is to increase your price. In this environment, it's easier because you're not doing it alone. There's a context as well. People understand something has to give. There's a pandemic. There's a war on. People know that the prices are going to go up. So there is an opportunity to, to, to move forward um, in terms of, of, uh, of pricing. But it's so contextual to your market, your product, and your competition then there's another factor which we won't this is what we'll talk about throughout the series no doubt but also the strength of your brand there's no better thing to have in inflationary times and a strong brand it's a bit late if you don't have a strong brand that's not a solution to the problem but it shows the value of having that that position in a market that is more defendable because you have an element of uniqueness to it and most things again come into play when, when we have inflationary times. Sean, picking up on, you know, the, so there, you, you unpacked a couple of different angles that we can you know, take on in, in future episodes. One of the ones that just kind of hit me as you were talking about it was the idea of Porter's Five Forces and specifically the one that marketers, the one force that marketers tend to look at and in a lot of cases scratch their heads and say, am I responsible for that one? Which is supplier power and the changes in supplier power. It's interesting that we're hearing more and more as we talk to executives that they actually and absolutely expect marketing to understand the supply situation, even if there's a sourcing, um, you know, a supply side function in the firm, they expect marketing to be involved in supplier planning, specifically, you know, in times of limited supply, you know, if you can't, fulfilled demand, 
who gets the stuff, <laughs> which customers get the stuff, right? right. Um, and, and, and there's a strategic element of strategic marketing that, that comes into that, you know, um, in, in other firms, again, depending on the strength of the existence of a, a supplier management or sourcing function, you know, marketing um, is often expected to highlight supply risks, right? Are we overly dependent on a single supplier? And should we kind of spread the risk a little bit more? Those kinds of things. I guess more and more, I think one of the things that this inflationary environment has brought to the forefront is indeed marketing is expected to understand the scenarios in the, in the situation with suppliers and be involved in, in many ways in the strategic planning around managing suppliers. And there's a couple of things there, Tom, because Renault, Renault for example, have, have announced they're reducing the number of parts per car, particularly with, with one of their sub-brands. But essentially, they'll buy more of less things. That's an engineering and a supply issue, but it translates through to the product. What does that mean for the product? Does that affect its differentiation? Is there something there that we can leverage? Reducing packaging, making things less fancy sort of defeaturing can also be sold as an environmental positive right because that's another external factor that hasn't gone away the need for businesses to be environmentally aware to be greener or to be as green as they can be is a benefit for, for many businesses inflationary times also give you some latitude to shrink to pull back and to defeature and you can sell that not only as an environmental benefit, it can put you into a different value area, into a more budget area maybe, or a different segment. People that care about, don't want fancy packaging, are happy to have refillable bottles. Another trend that you're seeing happen, Coca-Cola have a, have a refillable bottle strategy. It might be in India. I'm not sure the country to check me on that, but they're always looking for ways. Glass bottle recycling, it helps the bottom line it has an environmental positive and it helps combat these inflationary prices because it's in some ways reducing your costs. And these are yeah, the kind of things um, you, you need to be creative with. Yeah, Sean, I don't, um, I have some, some thoughts that, you know, I've seen examples recently. I don't know if they've helped the environment as much, but um, they call it shrinkflation. And instead of raising the price, you, you adjust, you know, your volume or your, you know, some of your product. And uh, one was toilet paper. They're, they're making the, the rolls of toilet paper with less squares. And uh, so I'm not sure about the environmental impact of that, but. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure about the environmental impact of, of my beers going from 12 ounces to 11.2, but I'm not very happy about it. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, sugar, I, the sugar that you used to buy in five pound bags are now four pound bags. And um, so, you know, there's I think there's a lot of companies that for the last probably almost, you know, year have been looking at it. But but now you can see even with pizzas and beer and everything that companies have to respond. Um, and, and Sean, I like what you said about context. You know, we notice it with the things that affect us the most, you know, and so I was listening to Bloomberg and Bloomberg, people were saying, oh, my Starbucks coffee went up to six bucks. You know, well, there's a lot of necessary things. So, you know, that's probably but there's some that all of a sudden we go, oh, my gosh, this really is serious now. <laughs> and that yeah. is like you said, when they reduce your beer size or your Starbucks coffee goes <laughs> out the roof. Yeah, or your gas so prices go outrageously high. Segment. But Sean's point about brand being a strength in these times is true because I'm still buying the 11.2 because I I love I'm loyal to the brand, right? I know I I love it. I, I, so you know I still buy it. I kind of swallow hard and pay well, up too hard. Less. It'll last longer if you don't swallow too hard. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's advice. Advice. Good I sip, I good sip on it. Good you know, Hershey's were one of the pioneers of shrinkflation. They they um. They overtly and clearly said in the, in the 1950s, they were shrinking the size of the bar simply to maintain a five cent price point, regardless of the variations in price of cocoa beans. And that they were one of the, the pioneers that said, yeah, you get less chocolate for your five cents or you get more chocolate for your five cents. 
but it's a really interesting idea that you who was that so who is it who is it Hershey. yeah 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 they they uh they they pioneered the idea of, of saying you know you're still going to get your chocolate you're still going to get your five cents worth of chocolate sometimes you'll get more and and it's an interesting idea isn't it that you can maybe not all products lend themselves to literal shrinking but how can you shrink that offer how can you when we talk about those concentric circles of your total offer how do you how do you shrink that and maybe have a, have a, a sufficient offer in these inflationary times maybe come up with a whole new yeah market. well and if you can't shrink your product then the other thing is to shrink the amount of money that your customer has to pay at a time so that's where you get into different pricing models or different business models as well you know we talked about you know possibly some type of subscription models and and if you haven't explored some of those things and you can't shrink your product but you're getting squeezed significantly um, start looking at different types of pricing and, and business models and and that might be one of them where you smooth out the the way that your customer has to pay you right. we've got a few topics to cover in this series then from branding to competition to Porter's five forces shrinkflation I'm looking forward to it yeah I am too we'll go deeper in and find some more examples we hope that uh, you are interested in this topic and will join us uh, for the, the future ones. And if you do like this, we also have uh, 12 other seasons of podcasts that you can check out. So thank you very much.